everyone. <laughs> My apologies for being a few minutes late. I was on a panel that uh, I think is just wrapping up right now on the other side of the hall. So it's a, a great pleasure to uh, be able to uh, talk to you this morning a little bit about my thoughts uh, around uh, the current debate about globalization, especially in relationship to education. Uh, so uh, I'll talk for a little while and then hopefully uh, we'll have some time for, for some questions. Uh, I've been thinking about how to reimagine our educational system for some time. Well, I've myself been a great beneficiary of post-war American education, the world, as we all know, has changed at an increasingly fast pace, and our own educational system has hardly stayed largely, has, has hardly uh, uh, managed to stay uh, in the kind of uh, position it, it was in previous decades. Uh, and in many instances, it's undergone dramatic decline. The excellent K through 12 public schools I went to as a kid in the suburbs of New Haven, Connecticut, are available to fewer and fewer students in our country, and usually only in expensive housing markets, and they even then have not, for the most part, kept pace with new educational thinking and models. And while our elite institutions of higher education are still the North Star of global universities, as attested in every ranking that exists. Uh, and of course, we now know that um, there are people around who will do anything at all to get into our top institutions of higher education. Uh, we also know that uh, there is growing a sense of crisis across the entire sector, uh, from the small liberal arts colleges like Hampshire that are struggling to stay alive, uh, to the great public institutions like Berkeley that uh, I had the honor to lead uh, for five years until a year ago. And of course, in the case of public universities, which educate 70% of the students in the US, the crisis, I think, is growing uh, uh, into a national crisis itself. So I'm here, of course, to talk, as the title suggests, about the global context for reimagining education, but I want to start with a few thoughts about my own experience at Berkeley, where I moved in 2012 uh, to be the 10th chancellor. Now, I went to Berkeley in 2012, 2013, believing that it, along with the state of California, was pulling out of the long funk caused by the Great Recession. Berkeley had lost more than half of its state funding in a flash back in 2009. Uh, and though it did its best to compensate by doubling tuition and increasing the number of out-of-state and international students, uh, it, in fact, uh, was, uh, was only beginning to look like it might recover financially, and that, too, uh, because there were hopes either for greater uh, support from the state or perhaps uh, a tuition increase uh, at some point as well, modulated by robust financial aid. Across the state, of course, the coffers were filling and the California economy, uh, irrepressible as it is, was refilling and, 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 and really uh, starting up uh, seriously again. But what I hadn't really realized, living in New York, coming from Columbia University, was the extent to which the university, and in some ways the state, was still roiling from the aftermath of the Great Recession. Uh, there had been even in the UC alone, major protests that took place in 2009 and 2011 over tuition increases. Uh, and um, they had picked up on and often been animated by a very strong Occupy movement, in the case of Berkeley, of course, being right next to Oakland, uh, one of the great sites for, for the Occupy protests. Um, no sooner did I get to Berkeley, of course, than more protests developed around Black Lives Matter. Uh, at the same time, uh, the increase uh, in quality, but the underfunding, which had led to real stress in terms of both continued expansion, a new campus at Merced had been opened up, but it hadn't really been given the funding it needed to start, uh, and other discussions about expansion had stalled. So added to that was also the growing resentment on the part of many California families at the thought that their 
uh, their kids, they pay taxes, but their kids could no longer get admission. And when we boasted at Berkeley about having a 15% admission rate, that really means there's an 85% rejection rate. So there was, uh, there was that, and then there were all kinds of other reasons for why the finances of the university were under such pressure. The state had stopped contributing to our capital needs. No more buildings were either built or maintained by the state after 2006. The pension system was in disarray, and we had to uh, immediately ask both, both staff and, and the university put in, to put in 12%, uh, uh, respectively, uh, to, a, to an underfunded pension system. This led, uh, unbeknownst to me, to, uh, to the governor, uh, Jerry Brown, uh, proclaiming a few weeks after I arrived in Berkeley that there would be, on his watch, a tuition freeze going forward. I found this out, actually, before he made it public because I was having breakfast with him uh, in San Francisco. Again, I'd just arrived, uh, and he was uh, talking to a couple of uh, Californians who came up and said, we love you, Jerry. We, you know, you're doing a great job. It's wonderful to, uh, to have you uh, back. And he said to them, uh, over me, since I was sitting with him, uh, that we are not going to raise tuition by a dollar as long as I'm governor of the state. Uh, an interesting uh, way to learn that uh, one potential source of revenue, which coming from a private university I thought was sort of routine, 3% increases and so on, uh, was not likely uh, to happen uh, anytime soon. Uh, by 2015, Berkeley uh, had, I think, suffered more than any of the other campuses in the UC system, uh, and we had a $150 million structural deficit each year. So it was really a major kind of perfect storm in terms of funding. So I spent my early years at Berkeley thinking about a strategic plan. Uh, I, uh, after a year of planning, I announced that we needed to fundamentally reimagine. It's a term I used, which probably I shouldn't have, uh, because reimagining is a threat to people who would rather uh, actually keep things exactly as they've been. Uh, and I said we should reimagine and even restructure the university. And I had in mind not just streamlining financial processes and uh, administrative uh, resources and support, uh, but actually uh, thinking about reimagining the academic structure of schools, departments, uh, colleges, and programs. Uh, and uh, indeed, I thought it might in some ways reinvigorate the university in order to have uh, an opportunity to genuinely rethink itself, uh, albeit under financial pressure, but nevertheless at a time when uh, the university still was very strong, uh, hadn't suffered any uh, diminution of its reputation, uh, not only in the state, but nationally and globally. Uh, and so, um, uh, so I tried uh, in my own way uh, to, uh, to, to propel a, a campus-wide and indeed um, university-wide discussion about change of a major kind. Now, I shouldn't have been uh, surprised, perhaps, that this was not well received. Uh, there were howls of uh, a protest about this. And one of the things that uh, was protested uh, as well was an announcement that I had made about the, an opportunity we had to build a new global campus uh, on a site we owned in Richmond, on the Richmond Bay, uh, 130 acres, uh, in collaboration with universities in China and Singapore and England and Europe, uh, using a kind of network matrix uh, to bring in resources from all over the world in ways that I thought could both enhance opportunities, both educational and, re and research, uh, and at the same time cut back uh, on our costs for a lot of different activities which could be funded by other universities. So in calling for that, in calling for a greater permeability with industry and with uh, other potential non-university partners, I generated uh, a, a serious firestorm fire of reaction. And I should have perhaps been less surprised than I was at the time. Uh, and I'm going to just read a couple of quotes from uh, the first chancellor of UC Berkeley, a man by the name of Clark Kerr, went on to become the president of the university, who. Uh, uh, of course, was a kind of legendary leader of the University of California. Under his watch, uh, the universities of San, uh, California at San Diego, at Irvine, at Riverside, 
uh, and at Santa Cruz uh, all were established. It was a time of extraordinary expansion. It was the time when he was able to work out a very comprehensive agreement with the state of California at the time, Governor Brown, but Governor Pat Brown, uh, the master plan uh, for higher education in California. Uh, it's still there, but it's a shadow of its former self. It was a system that some of you know well, which involved uh, basically providing higher education for every resident of California through community colleges, through the state system, and then both directly and through transfer uh, to the flagship University of California. But again, <clears throat> Kerr not only expanded, but he tried to suggest other kinds of changes. And he was a man known for his uh, extraordinary wit uh, and his quips about uh, uh, the life of the university administrator and uh, uh, even about uh, his exit from, uh, from administration when he was fired by Ronald Reagan in uh, January of 1967, within a week of, uh, of Reagan's becoming governor uh, of the state. He said, I came, I, I, I leave as I came, fired with enthusiasm. Uh, but again, he also said things like this. He said, the university as an institution was initially more a stronghold of reaction than a revolutionary force. He noted that faculty uh, are rarely the agents of change. I'm a member of faculty. I love uh, uh, being a faculty member. Uh, but Kerr was not wrong to say faculty are not usually the ones who are moving the biggest changes institutionally. Uh, Kerr went on to say the great universities of the future will be those that have adjusted rapidly and effectively to the important new possibilities. And he said the challenge for a university administrator was to make the collective faculty a more vital, dynamic, progressive force. Uh, and he came up with all sorts of ways of thinking about it. Uh, he called for the multiversity as opposed to a single university, which was to be a, uh, a multiplicity, a network, uh, and a community of many different communities. Uh, but of course, he wrote that one of the consequences of the multiversity as opposed to the old college or smaller university was that it was so many things to so many different people that it must of necessity be partially at war with itself. Now, the full force of this was driven home to me uh, months after I called for the, uh, for the structural uh, reimagination and restructuring of the university. Uh, and I decided that I would uh, start the changes and, 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 and step down in a year and do something else because uh, I, I, I thought uh, I'd, I'd seen enough conflict already with, uh, with Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter and others in the Berkeley campus. I, I didn't want to become the, uh, the object of, of protest. But I, 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 I did regret the fact that a number of things did not happen. And most of all, I regretted the fact that this idea of a global campus didn't take place. And I was, I was, I was, I've been thinking about that a lot, and now I'm going to really talk about the global context, because why is it that a, uh, a global uh, uh, proposal that would not have cost money gets the kind of reaction that it gets? And of course, today, we are dealing with um, a general reaction uh, to globalization. Uh, uh, thoughts on the part of many that uh, at a time of crisis, we have to hunker back and, uh, and withdraw and deal with our, uh, our own community, our own nation, our own state, our own problems, our own context. Uh, and, uh, uh, and yet, uh, it, it strikes me, and I think it strikes many other educators, uh, that this is, in fact, in some ways, a more important time to think about ways we can be global than ever, uh, ever before. So why, why is it that the global context, in my view, is both inescapable and a necessary component of any effort to move forward? And in this sense, to move forward genuinely to think about ways that we might reimagine, not just the university, but schooling from K uh, all the way through uh, graduate school and perhaps uh, through lifelong learning as well. Uh, so I want to uh, reprise and now talk a little bit about uh, our relationship to the world right now in terms of the global context of higher education. Uh, it will surprise none of you, I think, that uh, for the last several decades, American universities have become dependent on tuition dollars coming from what until just a year ago 
was a steadily growing international population of students. Can you get the slide? Uh, in 2016, 2017, close to 1.1 million international students were in the United States, a number that had more than, than doubled in the previous two decades. Now, the major growth has come from China and from India, uh, which send roughly half of these 1.1 million students, the greatest number uh, from China, but a little more than 300,000. Uh, but uh, just under 200,000 come from India. One third of students from China are undergraduates, close to a half are doing postgraduate work, either for masters or PhDs, and about a sixth are in K through 12 schools, mostly, of course, secondary. The number of students from India has risen in part because the US is now chosen over the UK, which used to be the destination of choice, and because of the steep decline in the quality of college education in the Indian subcontinent over the past several decades. The UK, of course, is also quite dependent on international students, uh, especially from Asia, as is Australia, which formally counts education as one of its major export industries and factors tuition and fees from Chinese students in particular as part of its annual higher education budget. Now, over the past few years, I've been working closely with a number of Asian universities, and I've seen for myself the extraordinary investment being made by the Chinese state in its higher education sector. Just last year, Tsinghua University in Beijing was ranked as the number one university in Asia by the Times Higher World University Rankings, displaced the National University of Singapore, which had been in that position for a while, before which uh, the University of Tokyo was the top university in Asia. Uh, Chinese universities have acknowledged, of course, the pride of place uh, of top U.S. universities, and they've not just modeled themselves on us, but they've also pursued partnerships of various kinds, including one that I was able to, uh, to work on uh, that was between Tsinghua and Berkeley, located in Shenzhen, now called the uh, Tsinghua Berkeley Shenzhen Institute. Uh, and of course, across uh, great universities in China, there's a growing attention to recruiting faculty and increasingly students internationally, not just sending them out. Now, I think we would be foolish not to assume that one likely consequence of growing quality and international collaboration will be a possible decline in students coming from, uh, from there to here and for reasons not solely associated with uh, Trump's, uh, Trump administration's rhetoric uh, about immigrants. But this is not, I think, uh, as one may first assume, another argument for us withdrawing from global engagement. In fact, one of the principal strategies of Chinese universities is to increase their continuing interactions with the world because that not only helps enrollment, more students, for example, now are coming uh, uh, from Africa to study in China than any place else, in large part as an expression as an outcome of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. But it is something that the Chinese understand does encourage further interaction, growth, and innovation. Students uh, develop loyalties, friendships, collegial relationships, and this has manifold kinds of uh, effects and outcomes. For example, uh, philanthropic support uh, to uh, joint research collaborations and even to education. Uh, Columbia, one of the first things I did at Columbia when I was in the administration was to raise money from grateful alums in China to support Chinese students coming to Columbia, for example. That's, uh, there's a continuing kind of interaction and we know that that's an important element. But there's also uh, a continuing commitment to doing uh, different kinds of collaborations, both uh, in the university space and outside. And if, if US, U.S. universities and governments decide to withdraw from these kinds of engagements and uh, this kind of global uh, uh, network, I think we will see a decline in our educational leadership in both research and educational areas. And it's salutary here, and this is the last slide I wanted to show you, that Japan, which for years, of course, dominated the rankings in Asia has, uh, in terms of universities, has had great universities, has in its withdrawal from the world, it has fewer students going abroad than ever before, fewer students coming in than ever before, uh, fewer collaborations and partnerships with, uh, with the US and other countries than ever before, is declining uh, in that kind of way. So I think that slide sort of captures what I believe the future 
would be uh, uh, for the US if we say, let's just tend to our own shop and withdraw from the world. So I don't think anybody here, uh, certainly at this uh, larger conference, uh, would disagree that educational exchanges and collaborations and networks are good to increase international understanding as well as creating sometimes lifelong uh, and life-changing uh, personal uh, and professional relationships. The more understanding, it's a truism to say, the more understanding we have in the world, the better off we'll be. But it's important to stress this uh, in, in larger terms, in terms of both research and education. If we're going to tackle climate change, we obviously have to do it together. If we're gonna take on global inequality, we need to think about this in collaboration. If we're gonna confront the likely possibility of global pandemics, most recently, of course, of drug-resistant uh, uh, infections, we're gonna have to do this. Uh, uh, transnationally. Uh, no wall, whether it's perforated steel or concrete, will keep germs from being global migrants. And for all of these challenges, educational institutions, I think, can continue to be a primary, if not the primary, ambassador of global understanding and global cooperation. But unfortunately, uh, the story I told at Berkeley is spreading. Uh, just last week, a front page story in the Chronicle of Higher Education proclaims the end of the global era for education. Uh, and uh, has a picture of John Sexton on the, on the front page, fist bumping a student at NYU Abu Dhabi on the occasion of her graduation. And of course, the story goes on to just show that universities are now engaged in retrenchment, pulling back from these kinds of programs, although it also acknowledges that there has been faculty resistance to these kinds of things uh, going back quite a while when Rick Levin, who was president of Yale, uh, inaugurated the collaboration with NUS for Yale NUS College. He got a lot of pushback uh, from faculty, even I think uh, threats of, if not an actual vote of no confidence. And that was before the, re, uh, the pushback on globalization. But in any event, uh, uh, I am now gonna conclude by saying that uh, I've taken a, a turn in my life uh, and moved from higher education to K through 12 education in large part because I continue to believe that a global approach to education uh, is not just something that is good, uh, fun, interesting, but actually necessary uh, for the future of our world. So I've recently joined a, a global company that is building a genuinely global network of K through 12 schools. We're opening our first two schools in September in Shenzhen, China, and in Washington, DC. And we have plans to extend and expand further in Delhi, in uh, London, in New York, uh, and in Shanghai uh, the next year, uh, and to continue to expand almost exponentially in years after that. And my excitement about the, the, about the project is that it's actually being built as a global school and as a global network. It's being, uh, it's in, in fact, doing many of the things that none of the great experiments in higher education were able to do. NYU was as global a university as you can have in some respects, but it was very much, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the route was in, was in New York and the branches uh, were in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and I think that what we need to be able to acknowledge in the current moment where we're moving perhaps from the American century to the Asian century is that uh, we can no longer be the sole root of uh, any kind of uh, venture that proclaims itself to be global. Uh, and that in fact to think differently about the global as multi-sided, as multi-directed uh, and with multi-stakeholder uh, participation at every stage uh, is critical going forward, and that's why I'm now the chancellor of the Whittle School uh, and Studios. Uh, and I'll just say a couple of other things uh, in closing, because I think uh, quite apart from uh, trying to find ways to actually educate new kinds of global citizens, uh, we're, we're thinking about innovation uh, in ways that are fundamentally different. For one thing, there's a question of scale. If you have multiple campuses, you can do things simply because you have greater scale. But to be located in different parts of the world means you can draw almost seamlessly from the best practices that exist around the world. Singapore math, 
Finland, of course, well known for its educational innovation. Shanghai for its high PISA scores. Uh, even Berkeley has uh, a, a leading role in developing a new kind of science curriculum for the 21st century. But you can pull these things together and find uh, through a, again, multi-sided, multicultural conversation, uh, a genuinely global uh, 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 technique to make the tapestry a very different kind. Uh, rooted in each locality, not an international school, just appealing to expats, deeply rooted, deeply connected, but also connected outside across a global network. And it feels to me that this could then in turn become a model not only for other kinds of schools, uh, for other kinds of networks, uh, but even for new kinds of, to go back to Clark Kerr, new kinds of multiversities that would be genuinely global as well, extending across the full life uh, that we invoke when we talk about lifelong learning. So in conclusion, uh, I believe the present uh, reaction to and pushback with respect to globalization and the educational world is misguided. I think it will continue for some time, uh, but I hope we can all find ways to embrace uh, an older idea on the one hand, but in a newer kind of idiom and, uh, and, and way now to make it genuinely global, which I think will help us figure out how to deal with all of these great challenges uh, in, our, in our decades ahead. Thank you very much.